Good afternoon, and thank you for coming today. I'm Jerry Moorhead, president of the University of Georgia, and it is my privilege to serve as the MC for this event, which launches the 32nd annual Georgia Economic Outlook Series, coordinated by UGA's nationally acclaimed Terry College of Business. This series has become Georgia's leading resource for economic forecasting. Over the next two months, programs like this one will occur in 10 different cities across every region in this great state. These events will provide businesses and public officials with the most recent economic data and analysis needed to make informed decisions for the benefit of Georgians. Each year, roughly 3,000 state leaders depend on the Terry College for its outstanding annual economic outlook presentation. This series, however, is just one way that the University of Georgia is helping to promote economic prosperity in our state. In Athens, we are providing workforce training classes to thousands of individuals each year at our Center for Continuing Education. These classes are helping individuals to invest in their careers and to find success in our evolving and highly competitive economy. Here in Atlanta, we have established the Office of Economic Development to strengthen UGA's partnerships with the private sector and the Georgia Department of Economic Development. This office is aggressively pursuing opportunities for UGA to help businesses expand and to help others relocate to Georgia. Travel to the coast and you will find the UGA Marine Extension Service and the Carl Vinson Institute of Government working diligently with communities there to create economic development plans that will address serious environmental challenges, such as flooding and storm surges. The University's Small Business Development Center now has 17 offices around the state. And with the support of this center, more than 300 businesses were launched last year and more than $75 million in startup capital was obtained. These are but a few examples that showcase the university's thoughtful, coordinated, and strong commitment to supporting economic development in this state. Each of you in this room today should expect this high level of investment from your land-grant institution. The University of Georgia is called not only to educate future leaders and conduct meaningful research, but also to extend our vast intellectual resources to improve lives and communities across this state and beyond. I think about this responsibility every day as president, and I am proud that many individuals at the University of Georgia are working tirelessly to ensure that we exceed it and that we will continue to do so. Today's luncheon is a great example of what can be accomplished through public and private partnerships. We could not host this annual event without the help of the individuals seated at the head table, as well as our many community and media sponsors. And I would now like to introduce all of these strong supporters, starting with the head table. Please hold your applause until everyone has been introduced. To my right and to your left, the Chancellor of the University System of Georgia, Hank Huckabee. The Vice President for Public Service and Outreach at the University of Georgia, Dr. Jennifer Fromm. And Dr. Jeff Humphreys, Director of the Simon S. Selig Jr. Center for Economic Growth in the Terry College of Business. And to my left and to your right, Dr. Ben Ayers, the new Dean of the Terry College of Business. Dean Ayers will deliver the state outlook today. Seated next to him, Doug Handler, the Chief U.S. E Economist at IHS Global Insight and today's National Outlook Speaker. 
Mark Lytle, the Vice Chancellor for Economic Development for the University System of Georgia, and Sean McMillan, UGA's Director of Economic Development. Please join me in thanking these individuals for their support. I'd also like to recognize the sponsors for this year's event. Our gold sponsors include AT&T, Afflect, Atlanta Journal-Constitution, Georgia Power, and Synovus. Our silver sponsors include the Classic Center, Gas South, Go Build, and R.W. Allen. The following are bronze sponsors this year. Bank of North Georgia, DPR Hardin, 13th Colony Distilleries, Jackson EMC. Our media sponsors include Georgia Trend and Georgia CEO. And this year's local sponsors include the Private Bank, Progress Partners of North Fulton, WABE Radio. And our community sponsors are the Atlanta Metro Black Chamber of Commerce, the Georgia Chamber of Commerce, the Georgia Economic Developers Association, the Georgia Hispanic Chamber, the Greater North Fulton Chamber of Commerce, the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce, the University of Georgia Small Business Development Centers. Please join me in thanking all of our sponsors for supporting this event. At this time, we will begin the economic outlook presentations. Today, we have Mr. Douglas P. Handler, Chief U.S. Economist, with IHS Global Insight to present the national forecast. In his role at IHS Global Insight, Mr. Handler is responsible for overseeing all aspects of the U.S. and Canadian macroeconomic forecasts and for leading the North American macroeconomic group of economists and sector experts. The U.S. team recently won the 2013 Consensus Economics Award for Forecast Accuracy in the United States. Mr. Handler's commentaries are seen worldwide and regularly appear in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Bloomberg, and other key print and electronic publications. Besides leading a world-class forecasting process, he is also interested in the role of technology in the productivity and job creation, as well as scenario development and the use of non-traditional data to support and improve day-to-day -day forecasts. He has more than 20 years of experience in economic analysis and forecasting. Past positions include executive leadership at Cisco and IBM, he holds a master's degree in economics from Georgetown University. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Douglas Handler to deliver the National Economic Forecast. Doug. Thank you, President Moorhead. It's a pleasure to be at the University of Georgia to present the national, the U.S. economic outlook here. Often, I sit on panels that are led by an international economist and I show the U.S. outlook. They say that the U.S. economy is going to be the engine of growth for the world, and I'm thinking, oh no. But then they show the numbers for Russia, for Brazil, for Japan, and then I'm thinking, okay, uh, maybe that's so here. So the U.S. economy, I think, in fact, will be this engine of growth, but it doesn't really stop my disappointment about how fast this engine should be growing. Uh, bottom line here is that 2015 will be a noticeably better year than 2014 with the faster growth you see on the slide, but it still won't be a genuinely good year. As you'll see in the slides that I'm going to show, demographics will be an increasingly difficult problem for the economy. There'll be a gasoline dividend to consumers that we're getting now and we'll get next year but some of this benefit will be eroded by poorer international economic conditions. 
a rising dollar, weak economic growth abroad means weaker export growth in the U.S., and maybe some import substitution as well. Bottom line is the domestic economy will be looking very good. External sector, not so much here. A bit of good news, too, is that Washington has stumbled on a properly neutral bit of fiscal policy. The federal budget deficit is down to reasonable levels. The economy still hasn't collapsed. But the Fed will raise interest rates next year. We think the event will be about like taking a two-year-old to get a flu shot, in that the anticipation is going to be more painful than the event. Next year, pundits are going to claim the economic apocalypse is near as their funding costs rise. However, once the flu shot has been delivered and the bond markets get their lollipop, we think this will be seen as a non-event. So let's start with some pictures here. The big question on the table for economists is, why hasn't the economy grown as fast as it had before the recession? And of course, the biggest reason is, in fact, that government deficit. During the height of the recession, the deficit was about almost 10% of GDP. That was the government stimulus that we needed to lift ourselves out of the recession. Now, with fiscal 2014, that deficit is only 3% of GDP. We've survived a loss of 7% of GDP in government spending. The word in Washington is, guys, the deficit is really fixed here. We see the deficit reduction in 2015 is really not being significant, and this could actually be a source of growth for the economy, but it's also like kind of saying not banging your head against a wall is a prudent medical policy as well. It's there in the numbers, but I'm not sure about the pragmatism. Consumers, housing, and business spending, though, haven't done all that well recently. Consumers have been hurt by higher taxes, that deficit reduction thing again. Wage growth and weak household formation are hindering home ownership. And businesses see risks everywhere they turn. But here's a real pretty picture here. The labor market added 321,000 new jobs in November and 2.7 million jobs over the past 12 months here. The unemployment rate has been relentlessly declining for several years to its current 5.8%. So what's the problem? Well, there are several. Here's the biggest one. The growth in the labor force has downshifted. Labor force participation rate has fallen by about three percentage points since the end of the recession. The central question, though, for economists is how much of this weakness is cyclical, that is, it's fixable with more economic growth, or structural, that is, something that's not going to be fixed anytime soon. The answer to this question determines what the Federal Reserve will do and when. A slack labor market means that wage inflation isn't likely to occur anytime soon, but a tight labor market may mean that wage inflation is just around the corner. There's a lot of discouragement out there. There's probably room for growth as people decide this is a good time to come into the labor market and get jobs. If this is a structural issue, labor markets could be tight right now, and wage inflation and labor shortages will get worse pushing wages up here. So let's investigate this issue a little bit more. Here's the point for the structural camp. Very simply, we're getting older. Our econometric analysis has indicated that we're growing older at a rate of one year per year on a per capita basis. As we get older, though, the likelihood that you'll remain in the labor force goes down. Retirements, job discouragement, taking care of elderly parents are just some of the reasons why participation rates go down as we age. And you can see the growth in the older age cohorts here as they've added millions and millions of people over the past several years. But as we're getting older, we're actually less able to learn new tricks as well. There's a lot of discouragement out there in the labor force. If we look at the pattern of jobs that were lost during the recession, there were 7.4 million of them, and compare that with where the job creation has been since the end of the recession, you see the source of this discouragement. There are over 2 million jobs lost in the manufacturing sector and about 1.5 million jobs lost in construction. 
and the vast majority of these jobs haven't returned. So where's the job creation? It's in services, it's in retail, in healthcare, in leisure. But that's not the whole story here. This slide looks at employment growth just over the past year and compares the sources of that employment growth with average weekly earnings. With the exception of professional and business services, most of the job gains are in the low-wage industries. Discouragement? I'm absolutely sure of it. Do people want to accept a $30,000 retail job in place of a $50,000 manufacturing job? Of course not. So the, the job mix issue here is one of the reasons why wage pressures really have not been a major issue here and has kept interest rates and Fed policy changes at bay here. Core inflation rate is what the Fed looks like when they try to set monetary policy and the core exchange rate, that is the growth in prices excluding food and energy, has been stuck at about 1.5% growth. And that'll be about the growth rate that we'll see next year as well when the Fed actually starts to act on interest rates as well. You can also see in the slide very interestingly that overall CPI growth in 2015 will actually fall to about three-tenths of a percent. Inflation will be next to zero next year. And of course, that's mostly a result of the decline in energy prices. And I can't wait to see what Social Security recipients are, are going to say when they get their 2016 uh, cost of living increases. It's, it's not going to be too happy. But let's look at Fed policy and look at what the Fed is going to do. We do expect that the Fed will want to continue, continue its pursuit of what they call monetary policy normalization, that is moving off zero policy interest rates to give it flexibility to either lose or tighten monetary policy in, in the future as needed here. For economists, the question is not only when the Fed will act, but also by how much. By midsummer, we think the economy will be growing fast enough and for long enough to trigger the Fed's anti-inflation sensors. They will raise interest rates, but not by much. The benchmark federal funds rate, which is near zero now, will be at about 1% by the end of next year. This isn't enough to materially slow down growth and in fact will signal that the Fed takes its inflation vigilance role very seriously here. It's our proverbial flu shot. So energy, of course, is making the a lot of the news lately and affecting about every economic statistic imaginable. So I did bring a couple of slides to describe a bit on what we see happening. The big benefit, of course, is to consumers and their wallets. We can look at average per household spending on gasoline that is fall will fall or has fallen at a rate of about a thousand dollars for each household that's an annual rate so that's got to continue for the whole year to get that thousand dollar benefit but that's a huge amount it's similar to the amount that we saw during the recession the last time gas prices were this low it maps into about 250 a gallon on average and that's a number that we really expect in the next two or three years and to persist for the next few months here as well. The savings can be improved, the savings can be used to improve savings, pay down debt, or merely just to buy stuff. Fortunately, it's the Christmas season and this gasoline comes at a good time. Our forecast for sales of stuff is quite optimistic. We are forecasting our sales for SYDN to be at about 4%. That is stuff you don't need. There is a flip side to energy prices down though, and it does affect business sector in very real ways and some negative ways as well. There are a couple big impacts that I'd like to explain. One is actually the, a benefit that we have gotten in recent years from declining oil imports. Quite simply, the boom in unconventional energy source production has shifted our supply of energy from overseas sources to domestic sources. That's been fantastic for the trade deficit. If you look at our forecasts, though, 
that benefit is going to be a bit eroded over the next two or three years here as the supply growth really gets retarded a little bit. The other big benefit is in just investment in drilling equipment infrastructure, that U.S. mining and petroleum structures. That's been a huge source of growth in recent years, adding about a tenth of a percentage point to GDP. And while we don't see a major collapse in that category, we do see that source com coming to an end, and there'll be the small declines. So whether or not you feel that gap should be based on the numbers we have here versus what they were before energy prices decline, I'll leave it uh, to you for that. So lastly, it is Christmas season, and we're all putting together our wish lists, and uh, economists are people too, and I actually have uh, the same sorts of wishes uh, as well. If I could talk to Santa Claus and I could get him to change the economy in one way, it would be to improve productivity. You can see the productivity has been sagging now for the past four years here. We do have forecasts of improved growth, but it's not the panacea that, that we need here. And how do we get productivity up? And you can see my suggestions in the bullet points here. One, it's education, education, and education. I list this three times just because this is really not about making everyone become engineers. This is about literacy in reading, computer literacy, and in fact, business literacy uh, as well here. And I'm absolutely not going to go into it given the audience here and their, their duties to actually try and change this. So I encourage and support and am rooting uh, Terry School on as best we can. Infrastructure investment. We don't invest in roads. We don't invest in ports. We don't invest in buildings anymore. We need all these things. These things help us become more productive. Anything that reduces the cost of doing business for our, our companies will, will ultimately be beneficial in the long run. Technology investment, improve internet speed, cost, and security. Do you notice your internet speed is slow? Advertise download speeds in countries like Japan, South Korea, and Sweden are actually two to three times faster than what they are in the U.S. Remove impediments to labor force participation. Absolutely, we're getting older. I'm not, but most of you are. Increasing economic growth will be increasingly dependent upon making those over 50s year olds more productive. Reduce the risks of doing business as well. I've been on the receiving end of many rants, particularly from small businesses, on what the heck they're doing in Washington. Quite simply, I try not to forecast what I consider to be political solutions, but I can say my words to Washington are, darn it, state a policy, debate it, vote on it, and move on. I believe that firms are inherently adaptable to many types of economic conditions, and they just need to know which conditions they're working on. And finally, increase economic awareness. Don't react to the hyperbole that will be coming forth next year. The economy is really doing well. We can proceed with monetary policy normalization without the apocalypse coming. We can continue to hire. We will be growing at a faster rate, despite people who say that we will not. We can even afford to pay a few pennies more per hour to uh, many of our workers here. Bottom line is, plan on better growth coming in the next couple of months. And thank you for your time this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Handler, for that wonderful presentation. And now to deliver the state economic outlook is Dr. Ben Ayers, the Dean of the Terry College of Business. Dean Ayers holds the Earl Davis Chair in Taxation. He came to the University of Georgia in 1996 and served as the director of the college's Toll School of Accounting for nine years prior to becoming dean in July of this year. Under his leadership, the Toll School of Accounting's undergraduate and graduate programs have been consistently ranked among the top ten in public university rankings in this country. 
Dean Ayers has received 11 teaching awards at the school, at the college, and at the university levels. And he was also recently recognized as being in the top 5% of the most productive accounting researchers in the United States over the past 50 years, something I don't think he'll probably be able to continue to do now that he's dean of the college. But he has been actively involved in the American Taxation Association, the American Accounting Association, and he has received national research awards from both of those prestigious organizations. Dean Ayers earned his bachelor's degree in accounting and his master's in taxation from the University of Alabama and his PhD in accounting from the University of Texas at Austin. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ben Ayers to deliver the state economic outlook. Ben. Thank you, President Moorhead, for the very kind introduction. And also thank you, Doug, for delivering the national forecast. Uh, we also will have some lollipops and skittles in the state forecast as well. I will tell you that from the Ayers household, we are going to try to limit the uh, SYDN production and consumption in Athens, Georgia. But, but thank you for delivering that forecast. Our highest priority at the Terry College is advancing economic development in the state of Georgia and beyond. As part of our efforts, we clo closely track the success of our programs uh, and the quality and success of our students. Our goal is to provide an education that prepares students to be leaders in business as well in their communities. We are especially proud when our success reflects positively on the state of Georgia and our culture of success is recognized nationally. As two recent examples, the Terry College placed 21st among all schools and 11th among public business schools by U.S. News World and Reports rankings of undergraduate programs. In addition, we had four programs that placed in the top 15 of all schools, and each of these programs ranked in the top 10 among public business institutions. Equally impressive, Terry was recognized as eighth among public institutions in placing our graduates on Wall Street, a very impressive indicator of the caliber of our students and their ability to compete with the very best students from other top business schools. These rankings send a consistent strong signal of the quality of our programs as well as the success of our students. In addition to focusing on our traditional undergraduate and graduate programs, I am pleased to announce that the Terry College is now offering an online BBA degree program that focuses in general business. This program will serve the state of Georgia and beyond by allowing students whose education has been interrupted to receive a degree from one of the very best business schools in the country. The program offers a rigorous education with the flexibility for students to continue to work full-time or part-time. It also builds bridges with organizations across the state so that the state of Georgia will have the well-educated, business-savvy workforce that's so critical to attracting jobs to our state. If you'd like more information regarding this program, please see the Terry website. Now, on to our forecast. I'm pleased to announce that the prospects for Georgia's economy are quite good. The pace of Georgia's economic growth will be faster next year. In fact, Georgia's economy will grow faster than the U.S. as a whole for the second straight year. Even better, both job growth and GDP growth will exceed their long-term average rates. This will be quite a positive change from what Georgia has experienced in recent years. Specifically, as you can see from the slide, we anticipate that Georgia's GDP to grow by 3.2%, and that's in the, in the black, and obviously all of our slides are red and black. Um, and that's higher than Georgia's long-run average trend rate of 2.9%. It also exceeds the 2.8% that we anticipate for the U.S. overall. And so the state of Georgia, we anticipate, will outperform other states as it should be. In addition, our expectations for job growth are relatively similar. 
In 2015, we expect a 2.3% job growth in Georgia. That's higher than the long-run trend rate of 2%, and it also exceeds the 1.8% for the U.S. that we predict. And you can see from the slide that we've had an upward trend beginning in 2010, and so we expect a slight acceleration in 2015. Faster job growth with limited job growth in the, or limited growth in the labor force will cut Georgia's unemployment rate by a full percentage point from its current level of 7.9% to 6.9% at this time next year. The U.S. unemployment rate will also drop from 5.8 to 5.6. And so you can see the trend and the gap uh, we've had in previous years with the U.S., and we expect that that will narrow in 2015. Again, that's very good news for the state of Georgia. Although it will be more difficult to find workers in 2015, we expect that wages will rise only slowly. Higher rents and higher medical prices will drive the slight acceleration. The good news is there's absolutely no signs of runaway inflation. It's unlikely that we will see a recession in 2015. The main reason for our optimism is the higher rate of job creation in the private sector. The faster job growth will occur in construction, followed by professional and business services, and then mining and lodging. The outlook for health services is also excellent. The number of individuals who require consistent medical care continues to grow at a rapid pace, regardless of the ups and downs of the business cycle. In fact, healthcare information technology is an emerging industry that we believe will add, add thousands of high paying jobs in the next decade. Georgia's strong transportation infrastructure will also spur more job growth in the logistics and the distribution industry, and that's been helped by the approval of the Savannah Harbor Expansion Project. We also anticipate that cybersecurity and the development of software and mobile apps will see strong growth in 2015. There are some economic sectors that will receive positive but yet slower growth. For example, the turnaround in real estate and the more favorable demographic trends will help Georgia's financial institutions. However, the cost of regulatory compliance and relatively fewer mortgage refinancings will be headwinds that will limit job growth in the financial activity sector. Georgia's large information industry will benefit from expanding film and television production, as well as surging demand for more sophisticated wireless services. At the same time, we recognize that Turner Communications downsizing will sharply ne limit net job growth in this sector in 2015. Concerns about property taxes, future pension obligations, and retiree health, uh, medical health care costs could curtail more hiring by state, local, and federal agencies operating in Georgia. So what accounts for optimism about Georgia's economic growth? Well, for one reason, there has been a renaissance in manufacturing activity in our state. Now that's especially noteworthy because in the last decade, Georgia lost four out of every 10 manufacturing jobs that it had. However, in the last three years, we've seen many manufacturing projects announced in the aircraft, automobile, construction equipment, life sciences, and flooring industries. Low domestic natural gas prices and rising production costs in China will also help Georgia win more manufacturing projects in 2015. In addition, concerns about product quality, intellectual, product, uh, intellectual property rights, as well as risk are making manufacturing in the U.S. much more attractive. And if you think about those are three dimensions where we as a country and as a state have a competitive advantage to overseas operations. With the economies of the EU as well as Japan performing relatively poorly, manufacturers who either want to or need to locate in more developed economies will increasingly choose to locate in the U.S. With respect to our state, the low cost of doing business, 
a favorable tax structure, as well as competitive economic development incentives will help Georgia forge ahead in the manufacturing sector in 2015. There are two economic policies that we believe will fuel growth in the manufacturing sector even further, and one of these was mentioned by Doug in his presentation. First, we must continue to develop a much better educated and more highly skilled workforce that's fully capable of using the latest technologies. Manufacturers are no longer hiring uh, forklift drivers or assembly line workers. Instead, they hire employees who are capable of understanding and using computer-aided production and design, design systems. Access to a skilled workforce has become a more important factor in the site selection for manufacturing projects. And when it comes to recruiting life science companies as well as high-tech firms, we believe that access to a skilled workforce is the single most important factor. Second, we need to continue passing economic development legislation that has made Georgia more competitive with other states when it comes to landing economic development projects. For example, in 2012, the Georgia legislature created a large deal closing fund and sales tax exemptions for energy used in manufacturing. And since then, we've won an increasing number of relocation and expansion projects. Some examples include Kubota's expansion in Gainesville that will bring in about 650 additional jobs, Baxter International's new facility in Covington that will bring in 1,500 biotechnology jobs, and the expansion plans in northwest Georgia in the flooring industry. Our economic development incentives are also helping us to compete effectively for non-manufacturing jobs, such as the 1,000 high-tech jobs that will be created by GM's new IT Innovation Center in Roswell. Another reason that we're optimistic about 2015 is the renaissance in construction and real estate development. Moreover, increasing demand for housing spurs activity in the manufacturing building materials as well as the transportation of those materials. Increased demand for housing will come mostly from job growth and will directly benefit home builders and realtors, and we know that this is great news for both of those groups. As of mid-2014, Georgia's existing home prices were still 9% below their pre-recession levels, and that's without taking into consideration inflation. And in this slide, you can see beginning in 2007, the trend downward to 2011, and since then, a relatively steady increase that we predict through 2015. We expect single-family home prices to rise by 6% in 2015. Lower price homes will appreciate the fastest, and that's partly because the lowest cost homes have the largest ground to make up. The upturn in lower price home sales also reflects investors' interest in buying these homes to use as rental properties. As potential home buyers see price appreciation, more will opt to become homeowners. In addition, rising rents will reinforce this trend. Another factor that will be conducive to economic growth in 2015 is the renewed immigration into our state. Next year, we expect a 1% population growth in Georgia versus 0.8% growth in the U.S. overall. Domestic net migration will rise to about 15,000 people in 2015, and that's compared to 5,000 in 2014. Now that's a major upturn if you consider in 2013 we actually had a net loss in domestic net migration of 6,347 individuals. In 2015, Georgia's population growth will also benefit from net international migration of about 30,000 people. In fact, international migration will be much more important to Georgia's current and future growth than domestic migration it's clear that population growth will be a strong driver of the state's economy in 2015 than it has in recent years. And this slide, if you think about this in terms of Georgia's economy from 1990, 
If you remember back in the 1990s when we were in a in very much uh, high economic activity, the dip in early 2000s with the recession, a peak back in the mid 2000s, and obviously in the recession. This has been an important factor in Georgia's economy, an important driver for many years, and so we're pleased that we are having an upturn in 2015. We're also optimistic because the recent drop in oil and gasoline prices should actually boost Georgia's economy more than the nation's economy. We are a major transportation and logistics center, and as you know, these activities are fuel intensive. Lower gas prices will also provide more relief to the average Georgia household than the average U.S. household. And that's due to our long commutes and, unfortunately, below average per capita incomes. Finally, since Georgia is not an oil producing state, there's literally no downside for low oil prices for us. Now let's take a look at three factors that we believe may mitigate some of the growth in 2015. While we are generally optimistic regarding Georgia's economy in 2015, these are the three factors we believe could curb Georgia's rate of economic growth. First, entrepreneurs typically attain the funds they need to start or expand their business by borrowing using their home as collateral. Now that's been a bigger problem uh, for Georgians relative to their U.S. counterparts. Why? Well, home price depreciation was much more intense here than it was nationally. And secondly, as you all know, we led the nation in bank failures. Consequently, much of the home equity that entrepreneurs would typically use to start or expand their businesses has evaporated. In addition, Georgia's relatively high number of bank failures has restricted relationship-based lending, which is so important for small businesses as well as entrepreneurs. While Georgia's home prices are on the upswing, lenders tend to focus on appraised values rather than market values. And so to the extent that there is a lag between the appraised and market values, this too could, uh, might restrain Georgia's entrepreneur's access to capital in 2015. Second, like other states, Georgia is vulnerable to cuts in federal spending. Fortunately, we are not overly exposed to federal fiscal austerity. Data for 2013 indicates that federal spending accounts for only 11.3% of Georgia's GDP, and that's compared to a 16.2% national average. Nonetheless, Georgia's military-based communities are heavily dependent on federal spending. In fact, Georgia's dependence on military spending is nearly twice the U.S. average. Thus, to the extent there are future cuts and it focus on defense spending, it will be relatively difficult on the state of Georgia. Third, if federal physical reserve policy shifts from a more accommodative stance that we currently have to a more restrictive stance, this will create more economic drag in the state of Georgia than in many other states. That's because Georgians carry relatively more debt and have relatively less savings than their U.S. counterparts. In addition, interest-sensitive economic sectors such as construction, real estate development, building materials manufacturing, and forestry have a relatively greater impact on the state's economy than the U.S. overall. In closing, I am happy to report that since the first time of the Great Recession, the Terry College forecasts a rate of economic growth that exceeds Georgia's long-run average rate. This improvement is due to four factors that we have discussed. First, the renaissance in manufacturing activity, the upturn in construction and real estate development, renewed immigration to Georgia that has been a powerful driver of economy in years past, and last, the recent drop in oil and gasoline prices. The good news is that the state of Georgia will outperform other states, the average states, in 2015 as it always should. The Georgia Economic Outlook Series is the largest outreach program for the Terry College uh, at the University of Georgia. We want to hear from you and receive your feedback about your time here today. You'll find on your tables a survey that looks 
like this. If you'll take a minute or two to complete this survey, leave it on the table. You can also do this online. We welcome your feedback. We'll use the feedback uh, in our plans for the future. Of course, there's also more to the forecast and what we can cover in a short program like this. Each of you will have the opportunity to retrieve the full version of the outlook if you so choose. On the last page of your program, you'll find a link, a link to retrieve the full report uh, as well as the redemption code that's on the slide. Thank you so much for your attention today. I wish you the very best in the holiday season and, of course, an even better 2015. And go dogs. Thank you, Dean Ayers. Well, this concludes today's luncheon. Thank you for your attendance, and thank you for your support of the University of Georgia and the Terry College of Business. And thanks again to all of our sponsors who made today's event possible. We wish all of you a joyful holiday season and a prosperous new year. Thanks so much.